This week's specific project, uh, I gave you a much more applied problem than usual. Uh, this was the analysis of an archival data set uh, from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. I picked those questions that we analyzed totally at random uh, because they had the data types that I wanted. So don't. There's no like theory behind anything that we just did. Um, but they, uh, I, hopefully they, they made sense. I wanted to also give you a little bit of practice in interpreting uh, public code books because this, this will be a useful skill on the data science side a little bit when we get into uh, web scraping API stuff uh, in like a month. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the setup here. We'll go through the actual project one at a time. Uh, this is the first time we use like a huge number of libraries also. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate that process as well. I just realized I closed the actual project document. Here we go. So, uh, yeah, I've already gone ahead and downloaded the files into various locations. So thing one uh, that we've started to do that we haven't done before, let's see if this works, here we go, is we have more folders this time because you needed to download the code book into your docs folder and you needed to uh, download the data set into your data folder, your dot tab. Uh, so hopefully you did both of those things. Uh, that was, where is it? Yes, download the code book and put it in appropriate location. So hopefully you did that. Uh, this is the code book that you should have downloaded, this guy right here, uh, which would have been the only way that you would have figured out uh, what the numbers meant in the data set. Uh, so hopefully you found this code book uh, and put it somewhere you could find it. In terms of the requirements, uh, I've gone ahead and already written the RStudio API code, uh, so that's already there. Uh, I've already downloaded the tab file. I explicitly said download the tab delimited file, and you might have asked why when there's a word that says R data format, I didn't just use that. The reason for that is the R data format is the file that you send me when you finish your projects that has all of your environment variables. So uh, when you, what an R data file records is essentially an R Studio environment with all of your, all the stuff already preloaded. The reason you don't do that when you use archival data sets is because once you change that environment, your original data are gone because you resave the environment. The environment is a, is a fluid file. It keeps modifying itself uh, as you change your data set. So that means if you ever decided, oh, I need to go back to my original data, you would have to re-download this file or recopy it in or reopen it or whatever else. So that's why you don't use the R data file. Uh, instead, use the tab delimited. The tab delimited file uh, gave you some real, uh, that name hopefully gave you some real clear clues onto how to import it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, library tidyverse. Uh, and then we need to move down to line 17 in order to start our data import. And line 18, we have a whole set, or the remainder of that block, uh, 18 through 24, we have a bunch of tasks. There's a huge number of ways you could have done this. Like, really, essentially infinite number of ways you could have approached this problem. Uh, I'm going to start with the easy part, though. Uh, health uh, underscore tibble, right? Yes, health underscore tibble gets read TSV because, uh, you know, it said it was a tab delimited file, so that should be real easy. Uh, W4 in home. Got to type it out correctly. DVN.tab. So task one is to see if that actually worked. And based on a, a light review there, it seems to. Uh, you could have also done it as a head health tibble. Uh, could have looked at it with glimpse, just to make sure there's not any weird variable names mm -hmm. at the end. And it looks pretty right. Uh, you see some there's missing values, but they're all the data types are generally consistent with each other. There's no points where you have, for example, ones and zeros, and then suddenly there are letters in the middle of the file. So it looks like this is cleanly formatted, uh, and you don't need to do any additional uh, work than that. You might have also opened it in a text editor, but this is a very large file, and you would have, uh, that would have taken a little while. Um, but if you were doing it for your own data, that you would have definitely wanted to try that. Uh, so, yeah, so we have a data set, but we need to do something else with it. So, uh, because you are only grabbing a certain number of variables, uh, the instructions read that you want to grab iMonth4, Biosex4, H4WP1, and H4LM29. The easiest way to do that is to use, um, is to simultaneously mutate with select. And to simultaneously mutate and select, you use the transmute command. Uh, you didn't have to do it that way. Uh, I'm going to show you doing it that way. Um, 
But that, I think, is the easiest in this particular context. You could have instead said select and then followed by a mutate. doesn't really matter. Um, but I think transmute is just a little more straightforward. So it also enables you to rename everything in real time. So imonth4 is what admin th month is. So we can just say admin month gets imonth4. Uh, the second is biosex4, um, which becomes renamed gender. So we'll start off doing it that way. And h4wp1 is, what is it, living mother? Yeah. And the last one, which is family interference with work, uh, is h4, oh, h4lm29. And that worked. And now in one step, we have all the variable names we want. They're not in the right formats yet, but we have all the variable names that we want in one little file. How many people use select? How many people use transmute? A few, okay. So this is, uh, again, this is a little stylistic thing. So uh, you can do it a lot of different ways, uh, but I would personally recommend transmute, uh, just because it is a little cleaner in the code. But not required, totally up to you at this point. Now we get to do formatting. So the things that uh, we're next required to do, rename, we already renamed, change gender and living mother to more appropriate variable types. What is that more appropriate variable type? Easy question. These are factors. Uh, you could just do as that factor, but that would recode the uh, variable using some arbitrary kind of system. Uh, I'm instead going to specify levels and uh, labels. That's just a little bit safer. Factor levels and labels. There we go. And again, this is this is a good. Uh, uh, I'm walking you through code development, so I know I need to make a factor, and I know those are the parameters I need, but I don't know the values yet. So I've just entered blank values for the parameters I want. So for gender, uh, the variable that we're changing is biosex four. So that really means that you should go back to this and figure out what that means. And if we go to biosex four here. Uh, you can find that it's a very simple code, one for male and two for female. So we can say our levels are one and two, and our labels are going to be male and uh, female. So that one was easy. Uh, H4, uh, what is it, WP1. Mm -hmm. And all I'm doing, by the way, I'm hitting Control F for find, if you're wondering why, how I'm popping over there. So Control F, find, and then I'm typing and pressing Enter. H4, WP1, and we end up with three codes. In this case, no, yes, and don't know, which are coded 0, 1, and 8. So we can do the same thing here, uh, 0, 1, and 8. And those labels are going to become well, 0, no, no, yes, don't, no. Let's run that to make sure that actually worked. Yep, and now we have our factors with labels, and if we look in view mode, everything is switched over. And again, if you were doing this on your own, you'd want to double check that against the, uh, the original codes just to make sure you didn't flip anything around. But since we specified levels and labels explicitly, that makes it a little safer. Remember that if you don't, it actually would work in this case, if you don't specify levels, it does it in order. So it would detect that there's a 0, 1, and an 8 in order, and then whatever your labels are would be 0, 1, and 8. So uh, if your uh, codes are not necessarily the same as that, then that won't work. So yeah, generally just a little safer to include both levels and labels, but I don't think you would have needed levels here since they're already in, uh, as long as you put the labels in the numeric order, that would be the key. Uh, for family interference with work, uh, FIW, you go look and see what that reads. Uh, oh, not called FIW, called H4LM29. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. We end up with one frequently, two sometimes, three rarely, four never, six refused, seven skip, eight don't know, and a dot for missing. So the task here is that you were given, very on purpose, was change any non-scale values to NA using replace. We haven't explicitly used replace in here, and the reason that I uh, linked to this on this web page is because this is also the sort of thing you should be doing. Uh, if you ever have uh, trouble with a well-defined programming task and are not sure what to do. I remember early in the course I said, don't worry about the internet. It will be more confusing than helpful. Uh, at this point, you have enough of a foundation where it will begin to be helpful. 
So uh, you still have to sort through stuff, um, but I gave you a link directly to this Stack Overflow page, and Stack Overflow is where you'll find a lot of such advice, with this super clear example right here uh, as to how to use replace within a Magritte pipe uh, in order to replace individual values. So that's uh, what I was hoping you would use. Uh, we're doing it in the context of transmute, but it doesn't do anything any differently. We just do replace, uh, and then we specify H4LM29, uh, I would do greater than or equal to six, since that's what our uh, code book says, uh, right? Yep, six, seven, and eight all should become missing values, uh, and then recode them into NA. If I run that, it worked. Okay, so that was the easiest way, I think, to do it. Uh, if you wanted to double check that, you can easily use the health or the table command in order to develop a frequency chart, uh, just to be sure that those are in, va in fact gone now. And you will find that that means that all values are either one through four or missing, because uh, missing doesn't show up when you use the table command. So there's a frequency distribution of the scores that we have left. You can actually see right there that it is very strongly negatively skewed. Okay, so that's your basic data import. So we switch over to the project again. We've got line 24, so we're going to jump down to 25. Uh, oh, 26, which is going to be write a comment that says visualization. Uh, and display density plots, box plots, bar charts, and scatter plots as appropriate of all variables. What do we need to do that? We need to do a ggpairs call on health.tibble. In order to run ggpairs, we're going to need to add another library, which is going to be ggalley. It's going to take a little bit to run. Uh, again, this should really be uh, your first step all the time. And you can see it's non-optimal. That's all those warnings mean, because uh, some of these have like a lot of lines in them. Uh, but in terms of just getting a general read on what this data set looks like, that's okay. You can see the strong negative skew that I just showed you in the frequency table. It looks weird here because it's a single item in a Likert-type scale. Uh, but you can see this would just be a, a skewed uh, negative normal. Uh, distribution. You see roughly uh, sort of normal, a little positive normal uh, on admin month, and you can get basic plots of everything else. Um, so yeah, this should always really be your first kind of step, this ggpairs command in um, data visualization and analysis. Line 29, we're going to write a comment called analysis. Uh, family interference with work on gender and living mother. I just realized I keep calling this family interference with work. That is an occupational health term, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, in the work-family conflict literature. Uh, the uh, next thing we're going to do, create a model to test the hypothesis that living mother and gender interact to predict family interference with work, controlling for admin month, using type 3 sum of squares by completing the following tasks. So, a lot of steps here. So in order to do a type 3 sum of squares, uh, the first thing that we have to do is uh, set our contrast options. Uh, this is basically just a copy-paste command. Uh, if you don't do this, then you're going to get slightly incorrect sums of squares. Uh, Contrasum and contrapoly are our defaults. If you were, uh, let's see, yeah, if you're ever curious what this was, I'm actually not sure it'll run like this. Yeah, we can run it on cases. Yeah, it basically creates contrast matrices automatically uh, based on a given n. So that's all you're telling it to do is create the matrices that tell it what to compare with what. So uh, by default, treat by default that value is contra dot treatment. So that means compare the current line, essentially the current sum of squares with error, whereas here we're actually creating a contrast table so that you're looking at the sum of all others against it. So you're, this is just a way to literally specify to do, um, to control for all other factors in your model, or for all other sums of squares in your model, uh, by creating this like matrix of ones and zeros. So that's all it does. Uh, so there's not really any mystery to it, but you, have, you definitely need to have that line before you run any type threes. Uh, so next thing that we're going to do, create models. So for type 3, we have to create two different models. We have to create, uh, it's really one model and then formatting. We have to create a basic linear model containing the uh, basic specification of the ANCOVA that we're going to be doing. Uh, and then we have to use the ANOVA command in order to format it into uh, what we actually need. So we're starting off by creating a linear model. You can name this whatever you want. Uh, linear model gets LM. And then we are, what are we doing? 
using prediction of uh, family interference with work. So FIW tilde, uh, controlling for admin month. And you don't have to put it first because it's a type three, but it's a good habit to get into. Uh, and then living mother and gender interact. Yep. So there's our basic model. We're going to need to specify the data import uh, as data health.tibble. I think that's right. Does it run? It does. So now we have a basic linear model. Uh, if you wanted to at this point, you could take a look at summary statistics and see what it looks like. You'll see that it is within your general linear model format. So you're getting uh, essentially what are dummy coded variables, uh, which matters only for one of them, uh, which is the uh, living mother one, which has yes, and don't know, and no conditions. And it also creates that two facet uh, interaction term. So that's fine. But since we're wanting to run this as, a, uh, as an ANOVA, we're going to next run the command ANOVA model gets capital A ANOVA on the linear model with a type three sum of squares. That won't run because we don't have the function imported. And that is in, is that in car or is that in, it's in car. Yep, that's in car. So now we have uh, the ANOVA model. Uh, we say create need a model display final model summary in ANOVA, temp ANOVA format. Well, that's it. There's your final summary table. Uh, so we can see that we had a significant effect of admin month, our covariate, as well as of gender, no interaction, and no effect of living mother in this case. Uh, and that's it. We have a model. Everybody with me at this point? All right. Yep. You kind of on the options, contrast. Oh, whoops. Yeah, then that actually was probably not a type 3. <laughs> Yep, we got to shift it around a little bit. Pattern was still the same, though, which is why I did not realize it. Yep, so your sums of squares flipped around a little bit. Whoops, thank you. So this is, uh, yeah, same pattern of statistical significance, but that actually wasn't a type 3. Thank you. <coughs> so, uh, okay. So next up is model diagnostic plots plus RDI plots. So those are two different things. Diagnostic plots uh, are your summary plots, things like le looking at uh, leverages, Cook's distances, etc. Our basic command for that is real easy. Plot linear model, because all of our helper functions and all of our sub-analyses always occur on the linear model, not on the ANOVA model. You see there's our residual. Our QQ looks a little weird. There's a little bit of a negative relationship on that fitting plot, uh, and that looks a little strange, too. All of which shouldn't be too surprising because we're using a strongly negatively skewed DV. Uh, and it's also Likert type uh, and one question, so there's not a normal, not even an approaching uh, continuous distribution. So there's a lot of weird characteristics of this particular model. Um, but that's what you would use, is these models to figure out uh, if you hadn't been paying attention to the GG pairs. So that's it. Diagnostic plot's done. Uh, the next stop, step is to do an RDI plot. Uh, RDI, again, raw data, description, inference. What is the easiest way to create an RDI plot? Pirate. Pirate plot. YAR will need. Uh, so we'll import the YAR library. And we're going to do a pirate plot. Uh, in a pirate plot, your uh, formula is going to be a little bit different because you're not really concerned with the covariate. You're just concerned with the actual variables themselves. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to put Y. I'm going to put FIW on living mother and gender. Data equals health tipple. And we get our basic pirate plot. Some nice, not so nice pirate ships. This one's a little normal looking. Not normal looking, but like a pirate ship. Uh, and that'll give you your basic output. You would not probably, actually I'm not sure what it does if you add the covariate in, but it probably just gives you it split it up as if it were a, a discrete variable. Is that what it does? Yeah. So that's not going to give you a lot of information, uh, so we're going to stick down to that. Okay. So this is again really just useful for basic assumption checking within groups. That's really the value of an RDI. Uh, you can also get a sense of where the inference is occur. Uh, you might have changed if you were curious about it. Uh, you might change this into confidence intervals instead of uh, Bayesian high-density intervals. Uh, but it doesn't really matter for this if you did one or the other. 
So, where are we? Uh, we are at C, display RDI, uh, display a marginal means line plot of the interaction. Okay. So to create a marginal means plot, we have to do two things. Uh, one, we have to create the marginal means, and then two, we have to plot them. So those are two separate steps. Uh, the easiest way to create marginal means is going to be with the LS means package. So we'll go ahead and add that now. Uh, you're also going, however, to want to clean up the results of that. So I'm going to go ahead and add the broom package as well. Because LS means is not going to be super pretty by itself. Uh, so first of all, let's uh, call this marginal means data frame. Uh, and I'm going to do LS means on my linear model. Uh, and I'm going to specify the two variables I'm interested in, gender and by living mother. I'm going to run that just to make sure, actually let's even take that out. I'm going to run that just to make sure that it looks like the setup I want. Yep, so I'm getting in this case an intera uh, interaction values. I'm getting gen uh, all of the marginal means split by both gender and living mother, so that's what we want for the interaction. Uh, so that seems to be working. Uh, however, it's not in a very friendly format, so I'm going to wrap that all in the tidy command, which is going to turn it into a data frame, which I can then use as input into ggplot. Uh, because I want it to be a little cleaner than that, I don't want to put G all of that as the input to ggplot. I'm going to go ahead and put that in as a mm underscore df, and then use mm underscore df. However, you could, if you really wanted to, just say this and then type it into a ggplot. That would work the same way, just really up to you. Uh, but this is more useful if you want to have those marginal means saved somewhere. Okay, so now we have a data set over here called mm underscore df. Uh, you can see that it contains our high and low confidence uh, limits, the, S the estimates of the marginal means themselves in each standard error individually, as well as our very large number of degrees of freedom. So uh, we can take that information and put it in a ggplot. I'm going to do mm underscore df, and then I'm going to create an aesthetic. In this case, I'm going to want living mother on the x-axis. And I didn't tell you which way you wanted to do it, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, you definitely needed the estimate as your y. Uh, and then I'm going to use uh, color and grouping for gender. And I'm going to spit that all into a geom line. And we have a marginal means plot. So you could have flipped it the other way because I didn't tell you. Again, that's always a, you know research question derived issue as to which of these is on uh, whether this or this are split the other way. So if you're more interested in uh, gender, you might have put it on the bottom, doesn't really matter. But you have to put that estimate as your y value. Because again, remember that ggplot uh, in this context is interpreting the estimate as just literally the y value. Um, we called that identity before. The literal y value is getting plotted here, not a summary of the y, value, the y statistic. So uh, that's what we end up there. You might do this in a different way. So, yeah, you could have, uh, actually, I mean, I can even run it real quick. Uh, you could have done it as, let's see if I got rid of, whoops, I really too much. Tidy, and then pipe that in, then remove this and put AES there. Uh, I'm just getting the lineup correct. And I would do the same thing. So, uh, so yeah, if, again, if you wanted to use the uh, marginal means later, you wouldn't want to do that, but you can. Again, unlimited sort of flexibility uh, with R. So just did a standard kind of pipe there. All right. So once we have the marginal means, we need to display two key post hoc tests regardless of, of earlier results. And I said regardless specifically because the interaction was not statistically significant. So normally uh, you would not really care a whole lot about post hoc tests, um, at least at, at this type. Uh, so uh, we're going to do them anyway. In this case, step one uh, should not be in caps. Step one is uh, to add in our interaction indicator. <laughs> Because we're using a multi-way interaction, we can't just throw this into Tukey HSD. It will get very mad at us. Um, so I'm going to do health tibble gets health tibble uh, pipe. And if you uh, imported the McGritter library, you could do that as all one thing if you wanted to. Uh, I'm going to mutate. I'm going to add a condition variable. I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it uh, condition. Actually, I'm not. I'm going to call it call it cond because we're real edgy here. Interaction between gender and uh, living mother with a separator of whatever you want it to be. It doesn't really matter. 
We check back over in Health Tibble. You can see I now have a nice, clear, easy to read set of all the conditions, female, X, no, et cetera. Um, I think if you follow the instructions that were given, you might not have had spaces there, so then all the words would be crammed together. It doesn't matter. Uh, essentially, all you're creating with con is a factor variable. You can see it over here. So those are just labels. It actually doesn't matter what the labels are. They're just automatically created for you when you use the interaction command. So it doesn't matter as long as you can read it. Uh, I just like putting the space in there so I can read it. Uh, next, I'm going to create our post hoc model, uh, which is going to be family interference with work on admin month, because that's our covariate, plus this new condition I just created. Data equals health to both. And uh, then I'm actually I'm going to look, can I look at that? Yeah, I can look at that. Post hoc model, just to make sure it actually ran. And yes, you can see how the conditions have been, in, and they're the same conditions as before, they just now are called conditions and are all saved as one variable, so it's all just crammed in there now. Uh, we're going to take uh, post hoc gets GLHT, general <coughs> linear hypothesis test. Uh, we're going to run that on post hoc underscore model and LNFCT equals MCP cond equals Tukey. Can't find the GLHT because we need to do library multi -pump. Okay. So at this point, when you can summer, we can finally display those post-hoc tests with summary post-hocs, uh, and you will get all of the crossings and all of the statistical significances for all of those crossings with individual contrast tests, uh, which is really all that is. Uh, so uh, that's your post-hocs. So let's step through a little bit about what just happened. Uh, just to remind you, we can't, uh, we can't just run Tukey HSD because Tukey HSD is expecting only essentially one variable in covariates. You can do ANOVA, you can, a one-way ANOVA, you can do ANCOVA, but as soon as you get multi-way, Tukey HSD doesn't work quite so well. Uh, and especially with uh, LM, it gets a little weird. Uh, so in any case, and this is just a practical recommendation, in any case, when you're trying to use a, uh, post hocs, or displays or whatever else, and it doesn't work on the base ANOVA model, uh, it means that you probably need to jump up. If your postdocs don't work on your base model, you probably need to jump up to GLHT. That's all. So if, it's, if you run it and you're like, the code looks right and it just didn't work, then you probably need to switch to this. Alternatively, you can just always do this because this will always work. Uh, all I've done here is I've specified that in order to test the uh, cond variable, use Tukey. That's really all that says. So there's a couple of other options, but nothing we traditionally use in psychology there. Um, so you could replace Tukey with a few other things, but usually Tukey. Uh, and the cond just specifies the cond in the previous line, right? So that's just saying use condition, that condition variable I created, and apply Tukey to it. Uh, that then runs the individual's uh, hypothesis tests, and then summary just displays all of it. Uh, again, at this point, we could run tidy and then export this as a data frame and do whatever we wanted with it. If you wanted to turn that into uh, a, a, a table for a paper, whatever you want to do, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we could do it at that point. So we're post hocs, display partial so effect size estimates for each component of the model. Uh, that we do with the a to squared command, and we're going to have to do it on linear model, and we're going to have to specify type 3 because, again, otherwise it's going to use the wrong sums of squares. Uh, a to squared, however, is not in this package. It is in LSR, is it? Maybe? No one's going to confirm that for me? Ah, yeah, it was in LSR. Uh, and that'll give you your a to squareds. Uh, alternatively, uh, if you wanted the full output, you could have, of course, added in ANOVA equals true. And that just gives you the full table. Otherwise, it's no different. It just displays it for you. Uh, and that's, that's it. That's our uh, effect size estimates. Uh, create an ANOVA summary table in APA format. Save to a file called analysis.doc. In order to do that, we're going to need our apa.aov.table command. Again, we're going to run this on linear model, not on the ANOVA output. Uh, put it in a confidence level of, .9, of 95, because that's what we always do. Uh, type equals three, and a specific file name of output analysis doc. That's not going to run because we don't have the library, so we're going to go back up here, include APA tables, and then back down here and run it. And if we go into our files, and I hope you are keeping your directory structure intact, uh, then we're going to go into our output, show folder, open analysis, and we should end up with the same uh, output that we got before. And there it is. And you can clean that up 
and then you would have your final publication quality table. One thing to pay attention to right here uh, is that if you forget type equals three, uh, that should be a point, sorry. Uh, if you forget type equals three here, these numbers will not be the same. <laughs> So if you notice that these numbers are not the same as your ANOVA numbers, then that means you forgot your sum of square specification, which I did multiple times while trying to create this. So uh, in confidence level, you'll notice that when I had it as, point, as 95 and not 0.95, it just totally ignored it. Uh, so if you wanted a 95% confidence interval, you have to specify 0.95 there. Uh, I did not require you to do that. Uh, you, if, if you forgot the conf level, I don't care. But uh, if you want 95% intervals, that's how you have to specify it. Uh, okay, so next, within your existing model, create a planned contrast test testing hypothesis that don't know if their mother is alive or not, have greater work interference with family than those that do, while controlling for admin underscore month. So that you should recognize as the same general model, again, because it says that, uh, within your existing model, so we're using the, the error terms from the model we already have, but we're doing a plan contrast test looking at two groups versus one group simultaneously. Uh, to do that, we're going to have to specify, uh, uh, we're going to have to specify our, uh, least square, our marginal means as the first step of this. Uh, so we're going to do linear model, let's call it LSM, you can call it whatever you want. LS means, linear model of living mother. And it's telling us that we're ignoring interactions, which we know we are, because that's the point of what we're trying to do right now. I'm going to hit a contrast test uh, of linear model, a least square means, and I'm going to give it a list. I'm going to call it whatever I want. In this case, I'm going to just call it knowledge, because that's vaguely what this is. And then I'm going to have to do a, a set of contrasts based on uh, the things I'm trying to compare. If you go back to your code book uh, for, what was this again? This was... Uh, H4WP1, H4WP1. Uh, you can see that don't know is the option eight and yes and no are option zero and one, which means the first two are the ones that we're contrasting with the last one. So we can enter in our contrasts of negative uh, 0.5, negative 0.5 and one. The key of course is your contrasts always have to equal zero when you're doing planned contrasts. Uh, so there it is. And we get a test of our, uh, our contrast effect, in this case, uh, not statistically significant. So line 50 uh, is going to be write a multi-line comment stating whether or not and which of your two hypotheses were supported, including which statistics and p-values used to conclude that. Uh, if you notice that this was directional, you might have like cut that p-value in half. It doesn't matter. I don't think any of anybody's p-values would have been different one-tailed versus two-tailed. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so as long as you wrote in something to the effect of, you know, neither hypothesis was supported, no statistically significant difference, significant interaction, uh, and then reported whatever f value you got. So in this case, it should have been 25018 equals 0.88, p equals 0.414. And no effect in the contrast. And this was, where is it, T, and your numbers may be different, that's okay. 5018 equals 0.657, P equals 0.512, something like that.